Welcome to Lunch and Learn with Industry. Our talk today is how to get your foot in the door, keep learning, and contribute to your company's success by Troy Coleman from Puget Sound Energy. So this is Troy Coleman from Puget Sound Energy. And Troy was born and, let's see, I'll read your bio. Born and raised in the Tri-Cities of Washington, Troy attended WSU at the Richland campus and earned his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering. Troy interned at both Energy Northwest and Pacific Northwest National Laboratories prior to graduating and beginning his career at Puget Sound Energy. Troy works on PSE's generation electrical and controls team supporting the generation operations and is pursuing a master's degree online through the University of Idaho's Education Outreach Program for Power Engineers. So, Welcome, Troy, and anybody can ask questions if you want in the chat. We'll unmute you towards the end, and I think we'll get a, a tour of the power plant, which should be pretty cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Greg. Um, so yeah, my, um, I'm, I'm going to try and, um, like Greg mentioned, uh, I'd like to keep the, the presentation a, a little bit short because I am working at a, uh, at a power plant here in just south of Tacoma, Washington today, so I was going to uh, as we wrap up the presentation, I was hoping to um, kind of walk you guys around the power plant. I was going to join with my phone and um, hopefully share my, my video so you guys can see some uh, real world engineering um, and, and see one of our power plants. Uh, so just a, a quick overview of what I wanted to, to talk about today. Um, thank you. Thank you all for, for uh, listening. Definitely appreciate your time. Um, but yeah, I, I was going to start with a, a background on myself, um, introduce you to, to PSE and kind of a little bit of history on, on the company um, and what generation engineering is. Um, so I'm, I'm in a, a small team of engineers and we, we like, like Greg mentioned, primarily focus on the generation operations um, for PSE. Um, so there's about 14 power plants that we, um, we rove around and, and help them with engineering needs. Uh, and then I wanted just to give you my my own experience, and um, it might not be applicable to to everyone, but just give you my two cents worth as you're starting to um, think about graduation and and getting out into the workforce. Um, maybe some of you are looking for internships and or looking to to start your first job um, outside of graduation. So I'll just kind of give you my two cents on on what worked well for me. Um, and then, yeah, towards the end, there'll be a, a show and tell. Um, so it's this plant that I'm at, it's called Fredrickson Generation. Um, so yeah, just, just south of um, Tacoma, but I'll give you an overview of the plant and then walk you around a bit, hopefully. So we, we already briefed, um, briefed on it, but um, like we said, um, so I was born and raised in the Tri-Cities. Um, was there for most of my life. Um, and luckily, they, they have a WSU campus right there um, in Richland. Um, so I attended there, um, got my degree while I was also interning um, at Pacific Northwest Labs for, for a couple years. And, and my very first internship was um, Energy Northwest, which if none of you know, um, they're most well known for the nuclear power plant out in the um, Hanford area. Uh, but they do have some um, small investments in hydro and wind and, and solar um, and a couple other business investments. So that's kind of where, where I was focused on during my internship. Um, but yeah, after um, WSU, um, I was lucky enough to get hired on at, at PSE, where I work now. And um, one of the benefits of, of working at PSE is that they pay for continuing education. Um, so I've been able to, to attend um, the University of Idaho online um, where I'm also trying to get my uh, master's in engineering. Uh, so a little bit about Puget Sound Energy. Um, it is Washington's oldest and, and largest utility. Uh, we're currently responsible for providing power for over a million electric customers. And I believe about 750,000 uh, gas customers. Um, our oldest power plant was actually built in 1898 and it's actually still in operation today. That's at Snoqualmie and I'll show you a picture of that. 
Um, and, and we do operate about, uh, there's about 14 power plants um, for, uh, or sorry, 16 power plants for combined uh, generation capacity of just over 3,500 megawatts. Um, and so this graphic that I'm showing here shows you kind of where, where all of our sites are, are located. Um, if you see down here, this one Fredrickson, uh, it's a thermal site. So that's kind of where, where I'm, or that is where I'm, I'm at today. Uh, most of PSE's generation is actually thermal. So natural gas um, or steam. We have a little bit of diesel, but yeah, about 66% of our, our generation comes from natural gas sources. Um, for a while, we were leading the, the nation in um, wind generation. I think we've been um, passed in that, but yeah, about 25% of our power comes from wind. And um, just 9% of our, our generation comes from hydro. So a lot of people think um, um, Washington's, Washington is pretty well known for, for hydro. Um, most of the hydro plants are owned by other surrounding utilities. Um, and like, I'm, like I said, BSC is mainly focused on uh, thermal. So just a brief history um, to kind of give you a perspective on, on how old our company is. Um, so yeah, 1873, um, Seattle Gas Light Company was founded and provided uh, manufactured gas to the area. Um, 1879, Thomas Edison invented the incandescent light bulb. Um, and just 10 years later, um, PSC developed uh, their, their first hydroelectric plant um, in Snoqualmie Falls. So that's kind of the picture that you see in the top right corner. Uh, so this is a, a picture of uh, Snoqualmie Falls that was built in 1898. Um, the generators are still in operation. Um, so under here, this shows kind of a cross section of the, uh, we call it the cavity. So underneath the falls, there's a shaft that goes 300 feet down and there's um, five generators here that output a few megawatts. It's not, it's nothing uh, super large, um, but four of those five generators were um, original uh, Westinghouse generators from 1898. Uh, after that, a um, couple other noteworthy things. Um, so 1956, uh, Puget Sound uh, received its first natural gas service. 1997, there was a merger um, where Puget Sound Power and Light and the Western or the Washington Energy Company merged to become the company that we are today, um, Puget Sound Energy. And it went and it took us all the way to 2005 to for us to develop our uh, our first wind facilities. So those are in Eastern Washington. Um, so Wild Horse is one of them that's in Ellensburg. Hopkins Ridge is in Dayton. And we now have a third uh, wind facility, Lower Snake River, and, and that's in Pomeroy and Dayton. So uh, generation engineering. So the, the group I'm in, um, there's about six, six engineers, uh, electrical engineers in this group. Uh, and we, we do cover the 16 power plants. Um, so some of the things that we do are equipment upgrades. So a lot of our power plants are older, um, 30, 40 years old. Um, so equipment is starting to age. There's a lot of analog relays that need to be um, swapped out, excitation systems, uh, things like that. So a, a large bulk of our, our projects come from upgrading equipment to new digital stuff. Uh, we're also technical consultants for them. Um, so if they do have any kind of engineering uh, needs, we, we serve that function for them. Uh, every year, the power plants usually have a, uh, an outage in the spring and the fall to do um, certain maintenance that they can't do when they're, um, when they're running. Um, so we, we help them with that, uh, that maintenance, get equipment tested, try to provide um, preventative type, type maintenance to figure out how long equipment might um, last for them to see when they, when they would need to have that equipment upgraded, that kind of thing. Um, we are heavily involved in the, the control systems for the, the plants, um, as well as the protective systems. So hopefully today when, when we do the walkthrough, I'll show you kind of the, the SEL uh, relay package that we, um, that we install in, in our plants. Um, I'll show you some of that. We do a lot of arc flash reports as well. 
Um, so those arc flash reports, we have to do those every five years to make sure that um, any energized equipment on site has an arc flash label, basically telling the operator um, what the what the potential energy is of that um, that equipment, and so that they can wear appropriate PPE. And then one of the more important things that that we're involved in is um, NERC and WET compliance. Um, so we we have to do a lot of uh, reporting and modeling of the the plants um, to to both of those entities. So yeah, this circle right here just kind of shows you my world. Um, basically, my world stops at the um, high side terminals of the um, step up transformer, the the GSU transformer. Um, but there's a whole nother world to the company. Um, the yeah, transmission system, distribution system, um, customer and residential um, systems. So there's a lot more than just just my little slice of the pie. Uh, here's some some pictures that that uh, I thought would be interesting. Um, so here's here's us pulling out a rotor at one of our sites. Um, this is one of our um, natural gas generation sites. So this is a rotor being um, pulled out and it was shipped, shipped away to be uh, rewound. Um, so this was an older rotor that had some bad uh, test data and it was found that it, um, the, the turns in it needed, um, were no longer in, in good condition. So we had to send it out to, to get uh, brand new turns. Um, hopefully I'll be able to show you this um, on the phone, but there's, here's kind of our, uh, our bread and butter protective panel or protective cabinets. So we do both um, generator and transformer um, protective relays. Um, and we, we normally have a primary and a backup relay. So everything that we protect, whether it's a generator, transformer, any motors, um, we, we like to have a backup protective system in there to provide um, in the event that one of the relays fails, at least there's kind of a fail safe and and a backup there to um, protect the, the equipment. Um, shown here in the bottom left is one of our consulting engineers doing analysis. You can see, um, I'm not sure what he's doing in this picture, but um, we do use a lot of test equipment, oscilloscopes, um, meters, lots of different type, types of equipment to, to help us with our day-to-day -day jobs. Um, and then here in the bottom right, that's um, myself performing in what's called an LCID test um, on a stator winding. So this was at our Goldendale facility. Um, another big uh, GE thermal generator. Um, these are the stator windings with the rotor pulled out. So um, the rotor is roughly this size. Um, once the rotor is pulled out, you can crawl inside there and um, there's different tests you can do. This LCID test is um, determining the, uh, um, the health of the core, basically, the stator core. So that's a little bit about generation engineering. Um, next, I just wanted to give you kind of my, my two cents on kind of what things you might want to, to consider as you're um, looking for internships and, and um, starting your career. Uh, so like I said earlier, um, it might not be for, for everyone. Um, so take it with a grain of salt, but um, here's kind of my experience that I've had and, and things that have helped me Kind of get my foot in the door in, in companies um, and, and network and things like that. So, yeah, the first one, I, I, I'm a huge proponent of, of networking. Um, usually there, there's some kind of technical um, community that you can get involved in. Um, I, was, I was pretty involved in IEEE Young Professionals. Um, young Professionals, um, as you might know, are already. Um, it's, it's a community for those um, that have graduated within 15 years. Um, and they, they actually do a lot of really good things. Um, the one that I was involved in was the Seattle section. Um, and they got quite a bit of funding really to, to send um, members to different conferences, um, this Fu Future Leader Leaders Forum, um, it was located in, in Texas, so you can apply, you can use the funds that, that they're given each year to kind of go to different conferences. Um, they often do monthly um, technical 
um, presentations. Um, before, before COVID happened, we were meeting at the Microsoft campus once a month and they would bring in some, um, a technical speaker. So you would, you'd be able to kind of um, mingle with, with different uh, industries and, and technical leaders um, that way. And, and there was also some fun things that we, you got to do too. So um, here's us attending a, um, a Sounders game. So um, it's not just all, all technical, but the, it's really all about networking, um, trying to learn different people, um, get, to, get to meet different people in, in your community who have a similar background as you. Um, and, and that goes a long ways. Um, so definitely recommend that. As well as volunteering. Um, so when, I would say when, when you get hired at a place, um, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for you to, to volunteer for different um, committees. And, and it really shows your, your employer um, that you're interested in, in, in the company and kind of what they do. And um, some of the opportunities that, that I was able, was, was fortunate enough to be able to um, volunteer for at PSE were like the intern hiring committee, um, which I thought was kind of interesting being a fresh graduate, um, being on the other side of the, the table um, and, and being able to hire interns for the company. That was um, kind of unique as well as um, the safety training committee. So um, even though I was um, fresh out of school, I was still able to, to be on a committee to, to provide safety training to all of our employees and, and things like that. Um, so those are the two, two committees I volunteered for, for the company. Um, and then uh, I, was, I also volunteered for IEEE. Um, I, I had an officer position um, and did some uh, uh, work for them as well for a couple of years. Um, my, my only, the only caveat I wanna say about volunteering is just to make sure you don't bite off more than you can handle. There was one year where I um, was volunteering for all three of these at, at once and definitely was a, a huge drain on, on my time and energy. Um, and I got a little bit burnt out. So um, just keep that in mind that you, you want to show interest um, and, and do things other than what your company is just paying you to do. Um, but make sure to, to not bite off more than you can chew and, and make sure you, you have the, the time commitment um, to, to actually spend, um, I, I guess, to, to give it the attention that it's due, um, I guess you could say. So that's my only uh, word, of, word of advice on volu trying not to volunteer for too much, but it is definitely worth, worthwhile. And, and um, it, it'll help you get uh, noticed in, in your company. And then look for opportunities to, to branch out as well. Um, it, it really shows your interest um, in the company and, and try to show interest in other people's work. So like I said, I'm, I'm in generation engineering, but there's a whole nother world to the company. Um, so just try and learn learn that other side as much as you can, um, if, if the company will allow you to, you know? Um, and so try and, try and job shadow or get out in the field and kind of absorb as much as you can from other people outside of your day-to-day -day, um, type work, because it really will help, help you form relationships with people so that when you get approached with a problem um, and it might not be your, your technical skill set you at least know who to go to and you've already built those relationships um, and kind of can, can help continue to help people um, even though you might not be um, an expert in, in any certain area. Um, so I'm, I'm a big proponent of trying to avoid silos. Um, you hear that word a lot in the, the corporate business world, it's work silos where um, like you're, you're in a department, like let's say I'm in generation and all I know is generation and anyone outside my bubble is just kind of white noise and, and I don't really pay attention to what else is going on. So I try and avoid that if possible, um, cross train. Um, so some of the things that I, I cross trained in at, at the company were um, 
we have a department devoted to residential and commercial customers. So generation, I'm kind of the start of, of the line. I, the power is being generated. So I, I wanted to learn, well, where, where does the power go? Like, what, are, what do our customers need? Like, um, so there is a, a department where you're able to do some engineering for, um, for the end user basically, and, and help them get their, their equipment set up and, and things like that. So, um, and then also, um, I've been pretty heavily involved in battery systems as well. So these are some of the pictures of the installations I've, I've done. Um, this one in the bottom left is a residential battery. Um, this battery supplies backup power to the, the customer. So there, this customer in particular experienced quite a few um, outages due to where their um, their house was. They they all they had overhead lines that were heavily um, impacted by trees during windstorms, which would cause an outage. Um, so they wanted a, a battery to kind of help them um, keep their lights on and, and um, everything when when the power was out. Um, so we helped them install this battery. And then this this battery right here, this larger one, um, is actually at a uh, at an office building. Um, so it's one of our um, commercial customers um, and it doesn't do backup power. It's actually meant for demand reduction. So this, this particular facility had pretty high and low um, uh, power peaks. And so this battery is trying to shave that so that it, um, it can uh, shave the, the peak power and have a more steady um, power flow through the, through the meter. And then uh, lastly, just don't be afraid to, to put yourself out there. Um, make it obvious what, what you want your career to look like. Um, you, are, you are in full control of what your, your career is. Um, uh, and so make, make it what you want it to be. Um, and, and something that, that my dad always told me growing up, um, and you can take this advice or, or not, um, but um, he, he was a proponent of uh, almost, if you're, if you're interested in a job, make the, the person aware of how interested you are. The, the job that I'm in today, I actually didn't get hired for it the first time I applied for it, but I just kept applying for it. Um, I think I applied for it three times before they actually hired me. And um, during the interview, the, the hiring manager joked and he said, the only reason I'm interviewing you is because I wanted to see your name off of the, uh, the hiring list uh, or the application list. Um, and because the, uh, they were actually looking for a senior engineer and me being fresh out of school, I did not meet the qualifications at all. Um, but I knew um, generation is what I, I wanted to be in. Um, and I made that apparent um, and I just kept bugging them. And, and like what my, my dad will always say is they'll either, the worst thing that will happen is they'll tell you to go away. Um, best thing they'll, that will happen is they give you a job. So um, just, just continue to, if you really want a job, just continue to bug them and, and let them know how interested you are. Um, Cause they'll either tell you to go away or, or give you the job. Um, and the, the last thing I, I want to say with um, putting yourself out there is um, instead of just attending a conference, um, consider giving a presentation. Um, you guys are all um, smart students. You're, you, you know how to give presentations. Um, so um, a lot of it, it, there could be some, some fear of public speaking there, but it's something, a skill to be worked on. And um, as you develop as an engineer, you're going to have to get comfortable giving um, technical presentations, um, a lot of the times to non-technical people anyways. Um, so consider doing that at a conference. Um, and oftentimes it, it eases the burden of, of your company as well because your tickets are paid for this way. Um, so um, not every conference is like that, but yeah, it, it helps you um, kind of get practice with, with public, public speaking and um, 
giving presentations on on technical topics. So um, definitely consider um, doing that as well as as you enter the workforce. Um, and just some generic advice that that I wanted to end on is uh, don't be afraid to to ask questions, even if you uh, think you know the answer. One of the um, biggest things that that was explained to me when I first got hired was that no one expected me to know everything. Um, you might feel a lot of pressure coming out of school to know everything because you just spent all the all these years and, and money getting a, a degree. Um, but until you really start putting it into um, into practice um, and going from um, theory that you're taught in school to to um, practical applications. Um, for me, at least, that's when it really started to cement, cement uh, the, the theory. Um, and so just make sure to continue your, your questioning attitude as you enter the workforce. Um, and you'll get a lot more, uh, in my opinion, you'll get a lot more respect that way um, rather than pretending you know something and then finding out later that you don't actually might not know what you're talking about as much. So there's no one is going going to judge you for for asking um, what might be a, a stupid question. Um, there, in fact, a lot of people in the room who have been out of school for a long time might not um, even remember either. So um, just please just continue to ask questions um, and and get comfortable using your resources. You know, your your job is not a closed book. You don't have to worry about. Um, you do have to worry about. Um, deadlines and stuff, but um, uh, it's not like taking a test at, in school where you um, you have to memorize a bunch of stuff and and have one one sheet of note paper or something. Um, use your resources to your advantage and and use other engineers to your advantage as well. If um, someone is more skilled in a technical area, um, give them a call. Um, develop that relationship with them and and, and learn from them. Um, don't be a, a one-stop shop. Um, try and branch out, like I was saying, and, and um, use your resources effectively. Um, and definitely take your time. Um, don't don't rush projects um, in an in an attempt to impress your boss, because um, oftentimes redoing something is way more expensive. Um, so make sure to to think through things the um, as much as you can the first time through. Um, and oftentimes you'll get a lot better result. Um, and one of the, the biggest things uh, is own up to your mistakes. Um, don't don't try and pass the buck. Um, if if you do make a mistake, it is embarrassing. I've made countless mistakes. Um, it's embarrassing. You have egg on your face, but people will forget about that. Um, what they'll remember is what you do when the mistakes are made. How do you respond to them, and, and do you take ownership of them, and do you help correct them? Because a lot that will go so much farther um, to them, and and you'll end up getting a lot more respect that way. Um, so definitely own up to. And there's no no way around it. You will uh, make mistakes in your career, uh, and sometimes they're expensive. Um, and hopefully. You work for an employer that that understands that mistakes do happen as part of a, a natural progression progression um, as you develop as a professional engineer. Uh, and I was reviewing my my coworker. Um, I don't know if any of you attended Cameron uh, Donine's presentation. Um, a couple, uh, I think it was end of October, um, but he works directly with me. Um, and I liked one of the, the quotes he had on his presentation was the longer you've been around, the more relevant your knowledge is. And, and engineering is such a unique uh, career that that statement is so, so true that um, the, the people with, with the gray hair are really the most um, sought after basically. And they, they bring so much to the table and, and, it's almost sad when when um, you have to attend a, a retirement party because the the company is just losing a a big resource, you know. So um, try to um, try to absorb as much as you can from the people that have been around a long time because they often know 
the history of why things were done a certain way and, and can give you a lot more context into things than that you would never learn from, from a book. So um, try to pick up on that and, and um, uh, choose a couple mentors when, when you get to the, the company that you, that you develop that relationship and can, can build upon your knowledge on because um, they, they really do know a lot of uh, information, especially in our field. Uh, so with that, um, I think we, we still do have some, some time to do a, um, a show and tell. So the, the site I wanted to um, walk you around is our Fredrickson Generation Facility. Um, it's a simple cycle plant. Um, you, you may have learned about these in a little bit, but basically the um, difference between a simple cycle versus a combined cycle um, is the combined cycle um, uses a condenser and the exhaust from, from the uh, turbine to heat up water and pushes that, um, that, uh, that steam that it produces from the heated water through a turbine and spins an additional generator. A lot of times they're about 50% more efficient that way by reusing some of the, the hot exhaust to heat that water up. Simple cycle does not have that system. Um, so it's just air goes through a, um, a compressor that gets mis mixed with uh, natural gas, or a lot of times um, you can also do diesel. So it gets, mi it gets mixed with that, um, goes through the turbine, um, an igniter goes off, lights the natural gas and compressed air, goes through the turbine, um, spins a shaft, and that shaft then spins the rotor, um, and you generate power through the stator. Um, so shown here, uh, in the upper right is just a, uh, a cross section of, of the uh, turbine. So all of these blades right here um, are just for the air compression. So air comes into these slots right here, it gets compressed. And then these valves right here are where your natural gas comes in or your diesel. It gets mixed with that compressed air and then spins, you'll see three, um, three rows of uh, turbine blades. And then on the other end of the shaft is usually the generator. So the site that I'm at today, uh, this is Fredrickson. Uh, so I'm right here in the office um, and there's two 75 megawatt turbines um, that I'll walk you out to. Um, and then I'll show you the step up transformer. Um, and if we have time, I could probably walk over to the, the substation, but I'll spend most of my time over here where the, the um, turbine and generator is. Uh, so yeah, right here is our generator step up transformer. Uh, so what this is doing, uh, the bus that you see coming to the transformer, that's gonna be your output of the generator. So that's 13, eight, uh, 13,800 volts. And then it gets stepped up to 115. Um, so from there, it goes over to the substation. Uh, so this is a pretty big uh, transformer. And this is one of the things that we um, have relays set up to do for uh, protection. protection. Uh, so we, these uh, transformers are so big that it's critical that they, they stay in operation because it's about a, a year lead time to get them uh, replaced. And they're very, very expensive, uh, usually in the millions of dollars. So it's important that we, we protect them with uh, proper relaying. Uh, inside of this, is my audio coming across okay? Yeah, it's great. We can hear and we can see good. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So yeah, inside of this cabinet um, is our generator breaker. So that separates the transformer from the uh, rest of the generator. So usually there's a breaker in between the generator and transformer. And then there's, there's going to be a um, circuit breaker all the way on the other side of the transformer inside the substation yard as well. Uh, this building right here is where the exhaust comes out of the turbine. 
Uh, so once the, once the fuel has been burned and it spins through the turbine, um, that uh, exhaust goes through this building and out the top. And there's a lot of work that goes into making sure that um, the chemicals in that exhaust are cleaned up and so that we are basically just releasing water vapor um, into the into the air. Um, so it, there's not a lot of, uh, there's some CO2 emissions, but not a lot. Uh, so inside of here, um, unfortunately, let's see. Might be able to open them. Yeah, so um, it might be a little bit loud in there. The unit's not running, but it is on what's called turning gear. Um, what you're seeing right here is the, um, the nozzles and the, um, the uh, uh, spark plugs, basically, for um, getting the, the fuel to ignite. They're really big spark plugs. <laughs> um, every power plant has a DC system. So you'll have big banks of battery systems. But um, there's usually about 60 for each year. And these are very, very important um, because they provide the control power, the um, protective power. So they, they're providing power to the relays. And they also, their most important job is um, to provide power to the emergency diesel uh, lube oil pump. So you can imagine these generators weigh many, many tons. Um, and there is um, lube oil that goes into the bearings um, to help keep the, uh, the shaft rotating freely near frictionless. Um, and it's very important that that um, lube oil stays um, uh, flowing through the bearings at, at all times. So during a loss of power, uh, let's say the, the line goes down, um, the plant would lose power. You want to make sure that that lube oil stays active, um, basically creating a, a frictionless surface for the, the generator to coast down on. Um, so that's why the, the pump is powered by DC so that you can keep the lube oil um, powered on even during a loss of power. Uh, next, I'll take you into where the, the circuit breakers are at. So this room right here, we often call the Motor Control Center, MCC. Um, and you'll see all of these things are called buckets. And each one controls a very specific pump, heater, fan, motor, et cetera, um, that is used to help keep the, the plant in operation. Next up on our show stop tour, I will take you to our control system where you'll get to see the, uh, our relay panels. So these, we installed uh, 2018. Uh, so this room right here is the control system. Um, the operators can log into this computer right here uh, and operate the uh, operate the generator from this screen. Um, so they can do everything they need to um, from from this system right here. Here's all of our SCL relays. Um, like I was saying, we, we have a, a primary and a backup for 
the generator and transformer. So our primary for transformer is the SEL487E. And some of the things that we, uh, we protect for um, are differentials, uh, differential um, current, um, over voltage, under voltage, um, things like that. Um, our primary generator relay is the SEL700G. Backup relays, um, backup generator is the SEL300G. And then the backup transformer is the SEL387. Um, and then over here on this panel, you'll see a number of SEL meters. Um, so these are all 735s. These are measuring different um, things uh, at the plant. So um, this is measuring um, generator power. Um, and this one is measuring uh, station service. And then um, down here, we've got a couple of handles. So if they wanted to, they could actually manually synchronize this generator. Um, a lot of times the control system will automatically synchronize it for you, but you can um, manually do that. And I don't know if you guys have had the opportunity to in any of your classes, but basically you have to synchronize, match your, your voltage and frequency and phase angle um, to get the uh, um, generator to match exactly what the grid is doing before you close the breaker. Um, otherwise bad things happen. Um, so a lot of these handles are, are controlling that kind of stuff. Um, and then these devices right here are called uh, lockout relays. And what those do is if there's anything wrong at the plant, like a, a relay sends a trip signal, those, these lockout relays will roll and it will physically prevent you from um, restarting the generator uh, until you fix the problem. Um, so it's kind of a fail safe to, to prevent you from restarting the generator with a, a trip held in and, and that's how equipment typically blows up. So uh, those are very important devices. Um, are there any questions so far? This is great. Yeah, thank you for sharing uh, this. There is still yeah. sovereignty, even though we've nope. the PD and PW for three years. We're running low on time, but. So, um, I see this move. I can show you the inside of this cabinet. There we go. Yeah, if, if we need to log off, just let me know. Um, so, this is actually the control system itself. This is a. Um, they call it a Mark VI. It's manufactured by GE, General Electric. Um, and all of these cards have a very specific function um, for helping the generator operate. And then uh, this panel right here is our vibra vibration panel. Um, so we, we do do quite a bit of work in, in vibration analysis. Um, you can imagine really heavy machinery that rotates really fast, 3,600 RPMs. Um, there, there can be little to no room for error for vibration. So we measure um, vibration in multiple points along the shaft. Um, so that's what each, it's probably a little hard to see on the phone, but that's what each one of these is measuring is um, how much is that shaft vibrating? And it's measuring it in thousandths of an inch. Um, so, which is less than a, the thickness of a, of a sheet of paper. So um, our, our typical rule of thumb is we, we do not want the generator to vibrate at more than six thousandths of an inch. Um, so we keep our tolerances are really, really tight on that. Um, another unique thing about this plant is it is black start capable, uh, meaning if the entire grid were to go down, uh, they do have a way to bring 
the grid back up, um, they, they can establish their own um, grid essentially. Most power plants rely on the grid to be already established before they can um, connect to it, before they can sync to it. Um, there are a couple plants um, in Washington that are black start, meaning there does not need to be a grid present in order for um, the, uh, the plant to be able to close a breaker and start producing power to the grid. Um, so there's um, a lot of procedures on, on how to do that, but this site, I won't be able to get in, it's locked. Um, oh, never mind. Um, the Black Start unit is a, uh, a diesel generator. Um, it's small, only a couple megawatts, um, but it is a very important generator to, to help uh, reestablish the, the grid. Uh, and like I said, there's uh, two identical turbines here. So that's number two, uh, same thing that we just looked at. They're mirror images of each other. Um, and what I'm showing you right now is the air inlet. Uh, so this, this is where the air comes in and then it gets uh, compressed over here and then mixed with the fuel. So one, one of the recent projects that um, I was involved in when I first got hired was uh, replacing this bus section. Um, so this, this is uh, 13,800 volts. Um, the issue that happened was uh, water was getting inside of the bus, which um, as you all know, is bad for electricity. Um, so it actually blew up the, uh, the bus the, um, inside. And so this had to be uh, replaced. Uh, there's several different ways to do a bus. Um, you can actually have, this is called um, a, uh, it's not isophase. Isophase is all three phases um, separated out individually. That's the most expensive, but it's also the most, um, the, the best way to protect your phases from phase to phase faults. Um, this one is just a um, non-segregated uh, bus, meaning that all three phases are inside that one bus section of bus. There's just a uh, small dividing um, insulation, um, dividing barrier between the phases to prevent phase-to-phase uh, -phase faults. I think I'll walk you guys over to the substation. So over here, everything is 115,000 volts. And you'll notice um, there's a number of circuit breakers and a number of transformers because uh, each one goes to um, slightly different places. Um, so once it enters this substation, um, it got all gets put on the same bus. And then from there, there's different bays in the substation where it gets sent out to um, wherever is needed. So I think one of the, um, one of these bays actually goes to Boeing. Um, Boeing is one of the major customers out here. So right here, this is a, uh, what's called a gas circuit breaker. Uh, the gas that is inside is SF6. Um, and it's a really, really good insulation material and helps, uh, helps extinguish um, the, the arc when, when the uh, breaker opens. Um, so that's an SF6 and I think, I could be wrong. I think this is an oil breaker. They're, they're older and not really around much anymore but I should be able to tell you. Let's see. Yeah, this looks like an oil breaker. So um, 
We don't really install those anymore. We usually use SF6 breakers or vacuum breakers now. Um, so I don't know a lot about those. Um, this is just a spare transformer. Uh, the ones that are being used are over here. So let's see what, uh, what voltage this transformer is. Interesting, this might just be a, uh, have a ratio of one to one. Um, it looks like it's just a delta Y transformer with the exact same uh, voltage rating on both sides. So um, unfortunately I don't know the, what the purpose is of the, this exact transformer. Um, like I mentioned in, in my presentation, most of my world is over there. So I'm kind of reaching the end of my, my knowledge when it comes to the, the substation world, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of a power plant in a nutshell. Um, that's all I had uh, prepared for you guys today. So thank you again for, for your time. Um, are there any, any questions before we drop off? This is great. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking extra time too to go through this. And if, you know, if anybody wants to watch it, they'll be able to see it since you said it was okay. So I appreciate your time, um, Troy. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And um, if, if you want, uh, feel free to send out my contact information. I'm always more than happy to uh, answer questions after, okay. after the fact. So, yeah. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All righty. Everyone have a good day. To learn more about the Lunch and Learn with Industry webinar series, follow the link in the description, and we'll see you next time on Lunch and Learn with Industry.